Shabbat Shalom, everybody. How are you guys doing? How are you all doing out there? Today is a set-apart day to our Creator. And that actually gives me a little bit of reading time. I've had people accuse me before of not taking the Sabbath seriously because I do lessons on the Sabbath. And I'm always reminded that there were a group of people priests who their job was on the Sabbath they didn't have a day of rest like the rest of us which is extremely unfortunate and I don't consider actually reading with you all to be something outside of Shabbat and these are topics <clears throat> that we address that we talk about and as I've oftentimes said majority of everything that I talk about and that I teach about is directed to myself it's directed to my family. And we're always constantly trying to check ourselves and trying to perfect a work that Yahuwah has indeed done for us and created in our lives. And it seems like week after week, there's a lot of reflection a lot of reflection in not just life but in the difficulty of living and maybe not in the difficulty of living but in the difficulty of living in the times that we are in because it's very stressful not only for adults who are trying to figure out the best direction to go and where we want to go with the information that we have but it's probably more stressful for the youth the children out there, the guys, the youngsters, the people who are literally probably the only people qualified for the kingdom are the youth, the youngsters. The rest of us have all been defiled. We've all lived our life in Babylon. We, we've seen it. Our eyes are the windows to the soul and much of what we have seen has corrupted us. So as we do reflection and as we look at trying to make ourselves a holier people and it's not a it's it's almost it's hard to have self-realization it is hard to to judge ourselves when we're judging ourselves according to such a good word I mean the words of James just in James alone it's a very convicting chapter it is a very it is very easy to look over this stuff and it's very easy not to apply it to our lives, but there are things within these readings and these writings that not only apply to our lives now, but apply more to our lives as the kingdom is coming, as the kingdom is on the horizon. And it seems that we break internally. It's not even so much the world that breaks us, but it's internal. And I believe there are forces of evil, the devils, demons, whatever you want to call them. But if you read the book of Enoch, it is literally like whatever you would call the souls of the fallen, the fallen angels, those who, who procreated with women and had babies. Well, they were not created by our creator. They were created by uh, phenomena of <laughs> angels being able to breed with, with humans. And they created a group of evil things, the Nephilim, the Nephilim, and the Eliad. Three different generations, huge ones, giants, right? And we don't have to go too far outside of these things to know that the these monsters, whatever you want to call them, they don't have a place. They don't have a hell that they're bound. So when these thousands and thousands of, of the evil Nephilim, Nephilim and Eliad were, were destroyed, their souls lived on and their souls are set to afflict us. And it is extremely easy as humans 
to fall into human stuff. It's extremely easy as humans to become addicted, not just to drugs, but to anything. You could become addicted to brushing your teeth. (laughs) That's how human we are, right? We could figure out our teeth aren't quite white enough and we could sit there and brush them all day long and develop a weirdo thing because we're humans, right? We, We do human stuff and that is the fun of being a human. That is... That is why this is such an interesting endeavor that we are in and such a great experience. And what we have internally that breaks us, probably more than externally, is how we internally treat each other. How do we love our fellow neighbor? And a lot of times, I guess for our family, we are, we are nowhere near any one of you. The only humans, the only people that we ever talk to are you guys. You guys are family. You guys that are hearing what I'm talking about right here. We live deep in the middle of a, a jungle. You can't drive in and out of here. We don't have neighbors. We do. I mean, we do, but they're long, long ways away, and there's like one when we see them, and it won't be, you know, two weeks. We'll see a guy in two weeks or something or go over, you know, in two weeks, but we don't talk to people every single day. We don't, we don't have these, these kind of interactions, but we still struggle the same as anyone else. In fact, I would have to conclude that because of us teaching Torah and the way that we have committed ourselves to teaching this Torah, even through rain, even through pain, even through agony, we are afflicted and probably will be afflicted even more than anyone else. And so my life and my heart and my soul is oftentimes afflicted with darkness that it doesn't make any sense. None of it makes any sense. My children are afflicted with things that sometimes don't make any sense. Things that I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand certain things. And it can only possibly be the influence of outside demonic influences that are allowing us to act and to behave in such a fashion. And if the swine are susceptible to having demons put into them, as our Mashiach, Yahushua HaMashiach, sent a tremendous amount of demons into the pigs, animals can get possessed. It's obvious animals can get possessed. I have 10 pit bulls. 10 raging pipples. that we do something that I do not believe anyone else in the world has ever done quite like we are doing. Most people that have a tremendous amount of dogs have them chained to one side of the place. They don't interact. They don't, they're not around. We have <laughs> literally, we don't have kennels. We don't have chains. They've never been chained. They, they all have people they sleep with and, and they, they, they just, they run around, they roam around. And so because of this, I believe that certain things are done outside of our control that will have these animals rage. And these, when these animals rage, it causes us to rage. It causes conflict. It causes enormous amounts of stress. I can't even explain the kind of stress that it takes maintaining and controlling 10 animals like this, 10 pit bulls. And it's not like chihuahuas. We're not talking little itty bitty chihuahuas or poodles or anything of the sort we're talking about the most notorious of animals and they're only notorious because the owners are horrible people and the owners do terrible things and it makes their animals go do horrible things but in a sense animals over you aren't like this i mean as a pack i suppose they would be but as things that are loved there's no rhyme or reason for a lot of the stuff that happens and so we end up with a lot of internal fighting and external fighting that is just it's just it's really strange so as we dash and dart into the books and scriptures and we check ourselves and we we constantly check ourselves and as i was explaining to my boys today and something i was trying to explain to myself today in this world there is nothing more important than our soul Our human body is going to die. Our teeth are going to crack and break. Wrinkles are going to come. 
we're going to get old. Our bodies are going to break down. We are going to go back to dust. We are going to die. Nothing. And we can't be scared of this. We cannot be scared of this physical death. But you should be scared of physical death if you're not keeping in the word of Yah. We have one shot at this. We have one shot to, to verify that we are able to cross over. And the only litmus test that we have when we cross over, if we want our souls to be protected, is that we are walking with the Torah, the way forward. If we have lived and we don't inspect ourselves under these mirrors, if we do not look at ourselves and compare ourselves to what Scripture says, and we walk contrary to what the Scripture says, we're missing our chance at, this, at the one chance that we have. Now the Christians will sit there. And they will not care about what the Torah says. They will not care about what the laws of God say. They don't care about the right day to worship. And it's dangerous and it's sad. And it's really scary because when you measure yourself against the holiness that our Creator has, and there is no evil in anything our Creator does, anything He says, there is nothing. There's nothing that says we should drink children's blood. There's nothing that says we should have adulterous relationships. There's no part of anything within from Genesis to the end of Revelations that ever has us doing or condoning or being evil. It's just about being patient. It's about us being holy. It's about us not fighting. It's about treating our neighbor as ourselves. It's about loving our Elohim, the Elohim most high with our heart, mind, and soul. Everything we have to give. Now, when we get consumed in the troubles of today, when we see all these crazy monsters that are on the television programming that are programming fear into you every single day, none of that is from Yah. None of that is from Yah. We walk alongside the most powerful entity that there ever could be, an entity that not only cares about you and loves you, but has a path and a way forward. The devil doesn't love you. He doesn't like you. He might make you rich right now. He might make this the best world. You might He might get you so entertained into this world, but yet at the end of time, your soul is gone. And if you enjoyed that life, maybe that's what eternity is. Maybe the eternity is a lifetime without our creator. Maybe it's living with these demons and these devils. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want to be there. And so when we look at us, when we look at how we talk to each other when we look and see what causes conflict we are constantly being inundated with evil we are constantly being inundated with stuff that doesn't lead to life and when we read the book of James it is it is incredible and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go slow on this. We're going to read it from two different versions of this because I think it's important that we understand this. And so let's talk, let's reflect, let's see what the Ruhak has to say. Where do wars, on the left side is where I'm starting on the, on the New King James Version. The, uh, uh, this, is the, this is the New King. Okay, so I was doing the NIV on the others. But this, is, this is fine because the other version, the, 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 my wife's version, which I don't know what it is. She says it's an Amplified Bible, but there's a bunch of Amplified Bibles and I was never able to find her current version. Let's read this. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? And so let's take that again. Let's look over at the Amplified Bible and, and let's, let's break this down even more. What does it say? It says, what leads to strife, discord and feuds? And how do conflicts, quarrels and fightings originate among you? Do they not arise from your sensual desires that are ever warring in your bodily members? Is that deep or what? Is that very first verse deep? Verse two. You have lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. The Amplified says you are jealous and covet what others have. And your desires go unfulfilled, so you become murderers. What does that mean? It says, well, to murder is as easy as having hate in your heart. That is what is equivalent to murder, my friends. 
If you hate your fellow brother or fellow sister or have hate for an incident or things that have happened and you're unable to forgive, it's as murder. You burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification, the contentment, and the happiness that you seek. So you fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. And that is quoting from from 1 John. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasure. Or you do ask, Yahuwah for them, and yet fail to receive because you ask with wrong purpose and evil selfish motives. Your intention is when you get what you desire to spend it in sensual pleasures. How many of us have prayed for wealth? How many of us have prayed that something, that we will, we will have something, right? And it says right here, when we get it, we become a different person. And we don't get what we want because it will change us and it will make our motives. So what we are asking for must be in the will of Yah. It must be what it is. We do not want to pray against the word of Yah. It is his way or no way, and his will is his will. And we must acknowledge it. We must fall in line with it. And we must be happy with it. This is interesting. Next verse. Adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Yahuwah. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of Yahuwah. The Amplified says you are like unfaithful wives and it's adulterers and adulterers. So this is like, he should say you are like unfaithful wives and unfaithful husbands having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to Yahuwah. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being Yahuwah's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of Yahuwah. This is deep stuff. What does it mean to be a friend of the world? I would venture to say that if you are in Facebook, you are a friend of the world. Do you have a Facebook account? Do you keep track of all your friends? Do you, they keep track of you? Do you want more friends? Do you have followers? Do you have people? Are you a, do you feel important when you tweet out something and people read it and you are with the world, right? Whatever you spend your time on is what you worship. If you have video games in your entire life, or at least say, let's say one sixth of your day, let's say one sixth of your day, you are in video games, right? You are becoming a friend of the world. Does that say video games are evil? No, I didn't say that. But what we spend our time on is what we become. How do we become an enemy of Yah and a friend of the world? Well, uh, it says that right there. If you choose to be a friend of the world, you, it takes a stand. It, it, the end of verse 4 there says, Whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of Yah. And if you're, if you're upset that I say that video games might make you take a stand against Yah... Have you read your Bible that same day? Have you been in prayer that same day? Have you sharpened your tools? And have you taught others what you're sharpening your tools? Does what you're doing breed contentment? Or does it breed adversity? What you spend your time on is what you worship. Verse 5. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? Before we go to the Amplified, that's a good question. Does the scripture say that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? Again, let's break this down. Or do you suppose that the scripture is speaking to no purpose that says, the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us yearns over us and he yearns for the spirit to be welcome with a jealous love. Guys, where inside of this do we hear about jealousy being a good thing? Where do we go into this and it says, um, 
you know, there, there's so many attributes to our creator, but there's none that say jealousy unless he's saying that he is a jealous L and there are no other gods before him, which I guess you could say that Yah is jealous. But for us, we're not Yah. <laughs> we're not a God. We're not gods. We're nothing like that. We are, we are created in that. Jealousy breeds evil. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. Yahuwah resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, I'll read on the, on the king over on the left side. Therefore, submit yourself to Yahuwah. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 6 on the right hand side. But he gives us more and more grace, power of the Ruha Kakadesh, Holy Spirit, to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. That is why he says, Yahuwah sets himself against the proud and the haughty, but gives grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. So be subject to Yahuwah, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. We've heard this before. We've heard about this devil fleeing. And a lot of us are unable to do that, right? We will get into a set of lust. We'll get into a set of something and it becomes that the human desire is going to trump the will of Yah. The will of Yah doesn't have us doing these things at all. And so we need to, as in verse 8 says, draw near to Yahuwah and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And it says, come close to Yahuwah and he will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal, wavering individuals and divided interests and purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. What does that mean, divided interests? Well, I, <laughs> what does your time consume you of? If you are, let's just say for instance, and again, it is not against the Torah to drink, but let's say you drink heavily every single day to the point of intoxication, to the point you pass out, right? That's your interests. Your interests have been divided because in our drunken state, in our state of this, we are susceptible to devils and we are susceptible to demons. We are susceptible to doing things out of our control. And um, it's, it's not a good thing, right? We don't want to be have divided interests. You can only serve one master. You only have one, one creator, one God, who you must serve. You're either serving him or by default, you serve Hasatan. Verse 9. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of Elohim and he will lift you up. What does this mean? As you draw near to Yahuwah, be deeply penitent and grieve, even weep over your disloyalty. What do we mean disloyalty? Well, if we weigh ourselves and measure ourselves against the Torah, against the walk of our Messiah, then we've all come up short. And if we come up short, we are disloyal. When our creator says to be holy in all that we do, and we are unholy, we are disloyal to him because we are going against what he says to do. We are not being faithful at all. We're supposed to humble ourselves, feeling very insignificant in the presence of Elohim, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up and make your lives significant, right? The Bible is very, very clear. It's, I don't, I hate to say it, but the rich people are gonna have a struggle. They're going to really struggle. It's easier for a rope to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to make it into the Shemaim. Riches breeds comfort. And I don't know a tremendous amount of people that are wealthy that even care about y'all. In fact, I would say it leans to the other way that most people that have cash have already found their own God, have already, they, they are in their own way God. They've made themselves content. They have made themselves secure. They by their own hands has done all of this. And if only they would see that there is a creator who is much, much bigger than all of us. We didn't do anything. 
We merely existed in a land, and if we are making our riches based upon a Babylonian system, that is contrary to Yah. So it is probably better to be dirt poor and wonder where your next meal is going to come, which two years, three years ago, I would have said that's insanity. But anymore, <laughs> we go month to month without buying food. We, we, we don't have, we are, that's, that's who we are and we are learning and we are becoming happy and becoming content. We lean far more upon Yah now than we did when we had food. <laughs> if we don't grow, we don't have it. It is as simple as that. Money is gone. Money is dried up. The world is the world is here. And if that is all that we have, then we are we are uh, lost. Our soul is lost, and and so we we must depend upon Yah. Verse eleven. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law. You are not a doer of the law, but a judge. What is this saying? Well, let's try it first in, the, in, the, in this uh, Amplified. My brethren, do not speak evil about or accuse one another. He that maligns a brother or judges his brother is a maligning and criticizing the law and judging the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a practicer of the law, but a censor and judge of it. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that if you're sitting there eating a giant pork chop and I say to you, you should not be eating that? Did I just, did I just ruin things? Did this just become a problem? Am I speaking evil to my brother because I'm trying to save my brother from an abominable deed, right? Every piece of bacon that you have is abominable in the sight of Yahuwah. So what does that mean? And how do we take this to say Phineas? who Phineas was, uh, he ran a spear through two people. He shish kebobbed them. And for that, he was called, he was called righteous, right? He, good things happened to him because he was able to take a spear and run it through two people who were creating evil. So does this mean that we should not be judging anyone? No, it doesn't mean that. We need to be judged according to the Torah in all things, in all things. We are not to judge the Torah. We are to take what the Torah says and we are to use that to judge people by. We're not, and listen, if we are judging folks while we have a giant plank in our very own eye, that's hypocrisy. None of us should, if we are unable to cleanse our own lives and to cling our own selves, then we are creating hypocrisy by saying, don't do this. This is one of the reasons I consistently and continually will use my family and our errors and our problems as examples in hoping that other people, hopefully that you don't have these kind of problems, but if you do, that you can try to find that there's others out there with these same issues and we're dealing with them in, in, a, in a hopefully a good way. But we as a tribe and as a people and for you as a family, you as families, I know there's a lot of siblings out there, a lot of families, a lot of this, and we are the very first thing is do not speak evil of one another what does that mean well brothers and sisters uh it's as simple as uh it's as simple as being evil right not everybody wants to hear a joke not everybody wants to be the butt of a joke not everybody is in a laughing happy mood and if you're sitting there causing chaos you're causing your brother to become agitated you're bringing in unclean spirits, then you are you are doing wrong. You're going completely opposite of what we should be doing where we're supposed to be building our brothers up. We're supposed to be guiding people in the way of righteousness. And we, we must first clean our own lives up before we do any of this. Verse 12, there's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Verse 12, one only is the lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy the one who has the absolute power of life and death. But you, who are you that you presume to pass judgment on your neighbor? Now, again, we're getting into this, the Christian philosophy. And this is what you'll hear, the Christian religion. Oh, judge not, lest ye be judged. Oh, I don't want to be judged by that. I, I, and that's what the Christians say, right? And that's what they would truly say because they're living in sin. So absolutely, they would not want to be judged. But when you judge, 
you must judge based upon the Torah. You cannot bring outside influence in. You cannot bring anything in. You cannot bring personal perspective in. And again, if our lives are not cling, who are we to judge? Who are we to judge? Verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Uh, Amplified, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a place and such a city and spend a year there and carry on our business and make money. Um, I'll explain this one here in a second here. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Uh, 14 here. Yet you do not know the last thing about what may happen tomorrow. What is the nature of your life? You are really but a wisp of vapor, a puff of smoke, a mist that is visible for a little while and then disappears into thin air. And yes, we are at the end of a many, many, many year cycle that our creator has generated 6,000, 7,000 years, something like that. We are at the end of this. When you do the calculations on it, we are right towards the end. Time is up and we can't count on tomorrow. We don't know what evils today will bring. We haven't made it through today. And if we are, well, we're going to go do this and this and this. Um, it isn't like that, right? It is only like a verse 15 says, it is only instead you ought to say if the Elohim wills, we shall live and do this or that, um, which is exactly right, right? Every single day that we get up, we must thank our creator that he has given us yet another day to breathe and to be alive. It is his for us to give. He knows when our heart will beat the last time. Nothing is promised to us. If it is the will of Yah, then it will be done. If it is not the will of Yah, it will not be done. Verse 16. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Um, I don't think I need to read the rest. I guess I can. It's, it's the same thing. But as you, but as it is, verse 16 on the right, you boast falsely in your presumption, in your self-conceit. All such boasting is wrong. So any person who knows what is right to do but does not do it, to him it is sin. There we go. And that is why we absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, need to have the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, written on our hearts, minds, and souls. If we do not write this on our hearts, minds, and souls, then we are not going to know what is righteousness. We are not going to know what is unholiness. We're not going to know what sin is. I don't know how many people you guys have told. I don't know how many people I have told. My own mother thinks I'm insane. She thinks I'm an old Jew. She says, ah, you, you can eat pork, you can eat all this. She's like, Messiah made it, made it cling. And you'll read. You'll read scriptures. You'll read Leviticus 11 that says it's an abomination. We shouldn't be doing this. But yet somehow the Old Testament doesn't apply to anybody. Somehow we have decided that we are better and that we can walk in our own ways, in our own desires. And just the simple act of eating pork alone is enough that is going to condemn billions of people to hell. Not simply the act, but that we are doing it in defiance with what our Creator says. And what if we've lived 50 years in the Christian church and we are a good Christian and we go to church every Sunday and we have potlucks afterwards and we, we spend time with the orphans and the widows and we donate our money to tithes and the church goes out and helps missionaries and we're, we're, we're bringing people to Christ and every Wednesday we have kids raise their hands and they're all saved. Well, that stuff's all contrary to the Torah. There's no such thing in the Bible. That, that's all doctrines of men and that is evil. And so, if we do not know the Torah, if we do not have it, and we're living in sin, there's absolutely no excuse. And the only thing that matters is our vessel that is carrying our soul. And I'm not saying the body is important, I'm saying that the soul, that is what we are containing and that is what we are trying to get to the kingdom. And the kingdom is not meant for those who are living in sin. The kingdom is not meant for those who are defiant to our creator. I don't think the kingdom is for pompous people, for pious people, for 
angry people. <laughs> I'm going to have a hard time when the kingdom comes. Simply because we know all of this and simply because we have had it for so long. So my friends, as we are warring inside of our own families, as we get to points where we have to take our vocals up decibels so that people will pay attention, that is all contrary to what we should be. We must be meek. We must be humble. We must be very fast to forgive, very slow to speak, and very slow to anger. And if we can get that recipe down, then we are on a better track, but we will always have work to do. We're never ever going to say, I'm accomplished, my salvation is 100% secure, and this is where we're going. You can never do that. That's why the once saved, always saved doctrine is insane. Especially when you, when you start reading the Bible, and you know, when you start reading the Bible, you'll see that most of everything you learned in Christianity is completely opposite of what the Bible says. And that's a problem. But the Bible says only a few are, few are called. I mean, many are called, few are chosen. That path, the big path that ditches everybody over to the evil side is super easy. Guys, we have a narrow gate. We all know the narrow gate is the narrow gate is our Messiah. The Messiah and the Torah. You, you, you have those two things, you cross that narrow gate. But if you start looking over the side and you see that, that large path and you see all these people down there celebrating and partying, it's real easy to just kind of tip over and fall right off the side and then you end up in this party, you end up in the world. And the people of this world, this world is, is ending. This, the world is fading. <laughs> if you can't see that the evil has overtaken this entire world, I don't know what to say, but... Uh, a few more years and there won't be flesh left. And so this is the time to get our hearts right. This is the time to get our families right. Guys, I hope you guys have a wonderful Shabbat. I hope you guys are keeping the Shabbat. I hope you guys are keeping your families close. If you don't have families keeping the Shabbat, I hope you're keeping it. Because your family is Yah. Your family is Yahushua. Moshe. Abram. Isaac. Yitzhak. Those are all our family. That's our family members. One day we'll see. And they've done it and so can we. Much love to everybody out there.